Hello and thank you for joining us on the podcast today. Uh, today's episode is a very special one. Twice a year, a conference called the Idea Exchange takes place in Birmingham in the UK. The Idea Exchange is a leadership development and networking event for leaders of young people, of young adults and families from across the UK. They come together and are equipped by some of the UK's most prominent Christian leaders who are, have bring their experience and their wealth of expertise just to really build up the leaders who come and partake in the event. The most recent event took place in October 2015. There were three amazing speakers, Dr. Carver Anderson, Pastor Kurt McAteer, and Pastor Mark Foster. And the teaching was truly transformational. In today's session, you're going to hear from one of those three speakers as they share with you the insights and and lessons and the subject of how we create a God-honoring culture in our churches. How do we create a God-honoring culture that attracts and engages young people? Take a listen as they share with you. You know, I'm excited about today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I have a sense, and the Bible reminds me that where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. I've seen so many things over the years, and Errol, thank you so very much for the invite today. And I love young people. They're my heartbeat. I love young people because the Bible reminds me that the energy, you know, I'm 58 next birthday, so I'm going to another dimension. (laughs) And... The energy I see in young people, I want to harness that because they've got it, you see. And that excites me about young people. And today, I want to talk about creating a God-honoring culture. Because it's in honoring God, as Mark said, that the world will be moved and changed and impacted and turned upside down. Because the Bible did say that about the disciples. Now, if I was just going to create a God on in culture by playing my drums, then I would just use the words, wouldn't I? And saying, love. Imagine if that's all it took to create this culture. I would be using my drums every day. (laughs) Hallelujah. But you know, Acts chapter, sorry, Luke chapter 4, verse 18 is a text I like to represent here today. So I was a young person myself back in the day. And in my PhD, which is this, there's a bit that says here, At the age of nine, my sister's mom, myself, arrived in England. By the time my father father was already here. One important issue I need to mention here is my mother's concern about me. Carver always mixed with the bad boys. What a label to carry. So, here I was in England having to share house with another family. Yes, this place was a culture shock. The food, the school, the people, the language, the music, the clothes, smells, and much more. Soon we got into church routine of Sunday school, divine worship, fasting, prayer meetings. You know the thing. We're going to talk about creating a God-honoring culture. So I'm just giving you my narrative here. So my mother started praying because I got involved with some stuff. Stealing, lying, cheating, deception. Now... As we talk about creating a God-honoring culture, God-honoring culture will pull this out because you've got to understand where I was. I got involved in a very deep and horrible place and my parents prayed on a regular basis for me. So that is part of my PhD. And school said that I would turn out to nothing. School said that I was lazy. School said that I was a young man that was going to go into a deep, bad place But my mother, in creating a God-honoring culture at home, said, No! My son is going to be honoring God. And that was her prayer. And believe me, hallelujah, on the 6th of June, 1977, at 11 o'clock at 189 Antrobus Road, in my bedroom, God knocked me down to the floor. I lived in a God-honoring household. Hallelujah. 
So that's why I'm here today. I've traveled around the world, Africa, Europe, all over the world, really, to speak to young people. But you know what I want to say to you today? As we create a God-honoring culture, my question, are we in the atmosphere for God-honoring culture here? That's my first question to you. When you left home today, did you leave a God-honoring home? Before I talk about a culture, I'm talking about the individual. You cannot talk about a culture without starting off with the one person who you are to be honoring God because there's no way a culture is going to emerge unless you, hallelujah, I've been honoring God at home. That's where it starts. I've seen thousands of people slain in the spirit. I've seen young people bawl and holler, turn upside down, do somersaults. I've seen it all. I've seen people blow on everyone just on the... But that is not the God-honoring culture I'm talking about today. Because you see, Mark is right. The God-honoring culture is when you are on the bus and lives are changing because you're there. Yeah, well. So creating a God-honoring culture that attracts young people. My work for Bringing Hope works with the most marginalized men and women and families in this country. Young people. And I will show you some of them. And how can a God-honoring culture engage the most marginalized? Young men and young women who are hard. They look in your face and say, and what? So how is a God-honoring culture going to help this then? Yeah, blood, where are you from, Don? <laughs> <laughs> what are you laughing for, Frank? What are you laughing for, blood? Now, you tell me now, a God-honoring culture, how are you going to pattern me? So after I've done all of that and I've intimidated you, I've caused you distress, I've caused you to not want to go to school or university, how is a God-honoring church going to develop a God-honoring culture that helps this young man who's wow. intimidated? Wow. Because you know what? This is real. I didn't mean that. That's fine. That's fine. That's fine. That's fine. <laughs> So I'm going to create a, an atmosphere here about creating a God-honoring culture that goes across the spectrum in church and out of church. So the aim to consider some key issues associated with how we create a God-honoring culture. I need to create that today. But I'd like you to look at yourself and see, and for me to look at myself, because a culture emerges out of an individual first. You can't just have the one person who's doing it. The culture emerges when a number of people start doing it, and it becomes regularized and it becomes the energy, and it becomes the norm, and it becomes normalized. That's the culture. So if we're talking about a God-honoring culture, what does that really mean? So here we have the idea exchange. So have you got an idea to share today? What's your idea today to share about a God-honoring culture? Is there a light bulb moment for us here today that you could say, cover the spirit of the Lord is upon me? Now, I'd like to read that text here, Luke 4, verse 18. And I want you to take this, please, and ask yourself the question, is the Spirit of the Lord upon you? Hallelujah. Luke 4, verse 18. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he hath anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of the sight for the blind to release the oppressed. Hallelujah. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. The Spirit of the Lord is upon you. I want just to locate our God on in culture just at that starting place. Is the Spirit of the Lord up on you? Hallelujah. Father God, I thank you for today. Your Spirit is upon us here today to proclaim your kingdom come that your will be done. Let us not be intimidated by bureaucracy, red tape, intimidation by any human being because the Spirit of the Lord is upon us. So as we create this God-honoring culture here today, we confirm that we will be resolute, we'll be prophetic, we'll be insightful, we will move in divine authority. And that's what the God-honoring culture creates. So that's why I'm saying I start off, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Before you talk about creating a God on your culture, ask yourself some really serious questions. Please ask yourself though. It starts off with your own reflection. Some of us, we go to church and we have some beautiful services. We sing. And those of you, I'm from a Pentecostal tradition. So I sing, I clap, I hollow, I say, Yes, Lord, we thank you. We get I, I do that because it energizes me, it makes Something's happening. However, do I ask myself those questions about creating a God-honoring culture, a God-honoring culture, a God-honoring culture? Ask 
yourself these questions, my brothers, my sisters, my brothers. Because that scenario I just did, unless I start asking myself, Carver Anderson, if you continue as you are, your practice, your attitude, will you create a God on in culture that attracts and engages young people? <coughs> on the bus, in my car, at university. Please note the question, the self reflective question. The question is that before I start saying yes, it's God on in culture here. I'm saying, Carver, look at yourself first. Self-reflection is where we start. So after you have self-reflected... Thank you. Thank you, sir. Am I committed to creating a God-honoring culture? Commitment starts in the heart. Commitment starts in the heart. Commitment is tested by our actions. Commitment can be measured. Commitment creates reliability. It becomes an atmosphere that it becomes reliable, that you are not second guessing because when you get into the atmosphere, you in fact, you leave from where you are and you go home and it's the same atmosphere. That's the culture. A culture then that is God honoring has some key components. So please note that it starts off in the heart. It's the heart of God that creates the culture. It's the heart that is in the word that creates the culture. So when I started looking at myself and say, Carver, are you really a God-honoring man? I asked myself that question. Because we can fool each other, can't we? We're human beings after all. We have the laugh. Oh, yeah, it's good to see you, pastor. It's good to see you. And deep down, you're hurting. God-honoring culture brings truth. That's what it does. God-honoring culture exposes folly. I'm going to another place now because that's what it does. A God-honoring culture, literally, when someone comes in and they are in a space of darkness, a God-honoring culture says, you know what? Today, God's just said that you're in a dark place. So a God-honoring culture is what creates the atmosphere for truth to emerge. Because God-honoring culture is not a pretense. I'm going to talk about young people that are hurting. And if we are not 100% in an atmosphere of change, they will go in the church and out the church. I understand there's a lot happening in churches because I'm a part of church that is vibrant and there's a lot of young people. But equally young people come in, young people are going. Commitment. So am I committed? Commitment supports integrity. Before I continue, I'm starting with me. A God honoring culture starts with me. My private world. When you don't see me, am I honoring God? Because what this is showing is that when we talk to young people about creating a God honoring culture, we need them to understand that it's also in private. It's also in private. So when you don't see me, what programs am I watching? Who am I talking to? What does my Facebook page say? What is my Twitter account saying? So the God-honoring culture has to start off with me and it has to look at all these spaces because Psalm 139 said, look, I know you're ready. Yeah, right. Hallelujah. Don't come to church and you're on the worship team and you're saying you're honoring God, but deep down in, you're in some dark place. It's okay, you know, because we all go through some very challenging thing. So I'm not here today to say everything's going to be okay, because it isn't. We're going to go through challenges. But in the challenges, I can do all things through Christ, Philippians 4, verse 30. In the challenges, no weapon that is formed against me is going to prosper. In the challenges, I have power over all. All that is there. Because I have the tools still in the challenges. I have some tools. Hallelujah. I got some tools. I'm Pentecostal. I got some tools. Oh. I got some tools. I've got some tools. I've got some tools. I've got some tools. And that's why I think it's important in a God-honoring culture to remember that there's a public face, the shared self, and the private world. And in all that, it's got to honor God. Now, I want to go, if we're talking about a God-honoring culture, this is a context. Now, you are and we are creating a God-honoring culture in this context, where you have young people and adults. You see this building here. Can I just say something about this building? Do you know this building that you're in? What's it called, please? It's called the Lighthouse. You know how the Lighthouse was built? You see this building here? It's built on the lives of some young men and young women that died on that stretch of road there. This building is built because... I was a part of an organization called Young Disciples, and I was honoring God in the midst of the dark space. And it was only because that organization was a part of this structure and the strategy why this building was built. 
So I was a part of a God-honoring expression and a lifestyle that impacted the lives of broken men and women who were part of instituting the strategy to build here. So this is built because of a God-honoring lifestyle. Do you understand that? Look at the history of this place. Ask them at Young Disciples, Carver, who was in the dark place, but every day I was cussed, I was F you this. I went through all of that, but I was honoring God. And in that culture, and as they started, energize, the energy of God honoring culture was upon me as an individual. Men and women started changing. Ask them. They started changing, changing, changing. So when people came with a gun in the place to do something, I'm a God honoring man. And what? So this building emerged out of pain and death, the lighthouse. So these are some of the things a God honoring, a God honoring culture literally considers struggling families. A God honoring culture will engage with all of this. In fact, Marx highlighted it. Diverse communities, that's what it does. It's not partisan. It don't say, because you are this, I'll come to you, and because you are that. A God honoring culture literally takes into account criminal lifestyle, people who are in, in, involved in crime. Educational achievement and underachievement. A culture, because remember now, a God honoring culture is challenging other cultures. It's challenging other cultures. A book that inspired me is R.T. Kendall's Anointing. The Anointing. And R.T. Kendall says, Do you have the heart for God? Do you yearn to honor Him? Do you aspire to seek not honor and glory of your peers? You know what? Excited. Is when I sense that God is pleased with me and not that you're pleased with me. Yeah. Even though I like you to be pleased with me. <laughs> but that God is pleased yeah, with me. Sure. With my action, my attitude, my approach. That excites me that God is pleased with me. And R.T. Kendall, it's worth re reading this book, The Anointing, is saying, you know what? The honor is not to do with how your peers think that you're great or not, but that God is pleased with you. So here then, we know that we have a... The death of men and women. I've buried a few men and women who have died on the streets. And when I go into the homes of men and women and their families, it's hardcore. I'm thinking, God, how do I bring your glory here? And God said, just love them, Carver. A God-honoring culture is unconditional love. It's agape love. It means then you're going to penetrate dark spaces and places. That's what a God-honoring culture does. It creates an atmosphere that changes the very fabric and the emotion. That's what a God-honoring culture does. It changes anything that is oppositional to the power, the love of Jesus Christ. It Hallelujah. Hallelujah. An example. There's a young man that died on a bike in Aston. Anyone heard about that? Right. His name is Taylor. He's a biker. He's from the lifestyle of the streets, so a lot of people know him. He's hardcore network. And there's very few God-honoring people in that network. So God sent me into that network. And the mom's saying, F God, I don't want it. What are you talking about, God? Blah, 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 blah. And God said, Carver, hear that pain. Don't judge that pain. Yeah. Hear that pain. And I hugged her as she says, what do you mean God this God? And I said, I hugged her, hugged her. And I bought that God-honoring lifestyle right there. I didn't mention you loved God, you love Jesus. I mentioned nothing. All she felt was the love of Jesus. Right. Hallelujah. To a point, she says, the only person I want now to pray for me is Carver. <laughs> kind of crazy, isn't it? A God-honoring lifestyle, literally, because that's what I did. To a point, I went down to the vigil at where her son died, and I bought my drums. God said, bring your drums, Carver. And I went there, and all they were doing, they, you know, they were grieving, but they grieved by, were they smoking bud or drinking whiskey? And God said, you now just start playing your drums and honor me here, Carver. And people just started crying. I saw the atmosphere change in front of my eyes. I'm thinking, wow. God said, that's me. That's me. Hallelujah. That's me. And people were just being embraced and loving. I'm thinking, God, that's you. A God-honoring lifestyle literally brings in an atmosphere of love. That's what it creates. Yeah. What it creates. There's hopelessness. But in that hopelessness, God-honoring lifestyle with love. And please note, divine authority is part of a God-honoring culture. Divine authority is saying that don't get intimidated by anything. Now, that's one thing for me. I get intimidated by nobody. 
I can't say that Yeshua is in me and I get By who, Don? <laughs> who are you talking to? I am a man of the most high and he's in me. And whilst I have love, I also have assertiveness. Whilst I have love, I also have compassion for you. But don't come to me and try to intimidate me because Jesus is here now. So a God-honoring culture is very discerning. It discerns. You discern. You see. It's divine. And it's important to understand, I think Mark mentioned, you know, the power of the Spirit that creates an atmosphere. So I will never negate. I'm an intelligent, in educated, analytical, all of that. But believe me, my PhD ain't going to do what the Spirit does. <laughs> I can't say, in the name of my PhD, go. <laughs> Go where? Jesus, I know. I don't know you're a PhD. Can't use those terms. You know, it's beautifully bound and it's in the international. But that ain't going to bring the love that is just expressed through Jesus, through us. Hallelujah. So spiritual warfare, a God-honoring culture penetrates that. Have you ever been in a warfare in your mind and you go to bed and you can't sleep? And you have flashbacks of stuff that you did 20 years ago? You probably don't because you're so righteous people. I don't know. But I go through some of those stuff and I'm trying to shake it. I'm rebuking. I'm laying hands on my head. I'm pouring oil on my head. I'm doing all sorts of stuff. I don't know if... You don't do those stuff, you know, because you... <laughs> I'm doing everything. I'm walking up and down. I'm repeating 25. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall know what. He maketh me to lie down. In the name of Jesus, I know, Lord, you... I do all those things, and I still can't sleep. And what the Lord reminds me of, Carver, you don't have to force any of this. In a God-honoring atmosphere, just let it happen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Just let it happen. Stop. Just let it happen. And that's what I've learned. So I'm now a freed man, and I'm thinking, God, why didn't I learn this before? But you know what a God-honoring culture does? It teaches you truth. That's what it does. Confusion and doubt. Young people will have that in the church. Young people out of the church will have that, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that in a bit. Church and community detachment. My research, I've spoken to many young people, and they've said to me, Carver, some of the churches are so detached from us, they don't know us. How can we have a God-honoring culture that does not engage young people, though? I don't understand that. But I do, because it's created, some churches create an, an atmosphere that is them and us. If you are not in a particular way, or you don't look a particular way, you're not acting a particular way, you can't be a part of this crew. Jesus didn't say that. He said, I've come to seek and to save all who are lost. And the scripture, John 3, verse 16, for God so that whosoever, black, South Asian, white European, street, non-street, hardcore, semi-hardcore, bad boy, bad, whatever, whoever, yeah. hallelujah, whoever, whoever. And a God-honoring culture that is created Firstly, by you honoring God by yourself, having a God-honoring home and a God-honoring lifestyle. Do you know a lifestyle that is negative? You know it, don't you? How do you know a lifestyle that is negative? How do you know men and women from the street who have a lifestyle that's negative? What do you see? What are some of the signs? Negative lifestyle. Language. What else? Dress. What else? Body language. So you can tell negative lifestyle, but a God-honoring lifestyle is not about how you dress, but it's about the heart of that person. Because I know now I can go into a room and I could feel the energy by the hearts of the people beyond how they dress. So a God-honoring culture is your heart for God, your heart for righteousness, your heart of compassion, your heart of discernment, your heart to literally use the divine authority. A God-honoring culture takes all the tools that's in the word of God and use them for the benefit to give God glory. That's what it does. A God-honoring, are we relevant? Look at what is said here by some of the young men that I've spoken to in my research. I was brought up in a Christian family, but it didn't connect with me. I reckon religion is a thing, what you would feel that's right. So Christianity don't reflect for me. So this is what someone said. And then another person said, I don't think church leaders understand the streets where we come from. They are scared to link with mans like me. A God-honoring culture don't, it's not frightened. A God-honoring culture literally reminds us that we have power Luke 10 verse 19, over all the power of the enemy and nothing can harm us. 
So this is what was said. I've literally spent thousands of hours talking to people from the streets. And they're saying, Carver, I understand the church thing, you know. But you know what? Why am I being judged the way I'm being judged? And I feel that people look down on me. They look down on me, Carver. Why can't they be like you? When they say that, I'm thinking, well, what am I? Who am I? It means I just love them in a particular way. I don't judge. A God-honoring culture sees the situation. But a God-honoring culture does not compromise still. Mark said it. I've handed a gun into the police. Why? Because I'm not compromising with this image here. So we disarm and we hand the gun into the police, we're ringing the police. A god in culture means that when someone came there to kill someone across the road, and I'm there and the guy downstairs with his gun, I'm saying we got to ring the police. That's God-honoring for me. Hardcore, but God-honoring. So then, brothers, sisters, friends, our use are our responsibility. I want to just let that go deep. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Our youths are our responsibility. And you know, a man like Errol, who I respect, who has been a youth, is now a man, and he's seen the heart of the youths and saying, you know what? As a church, as a group, as men and women of God, we want to ensure that that generation, we don't lose them. Thank you, Errol. We don't lose them. I've buried some, sir and ma'am. <laughs> I've gone to prison and they're there. I'm, I'm leaving from here in the afternoon and I'm going to the prison because they're there. But you know what I want to say? A God-honoring culture discerns and saying, Lord, and call the names of them. And a God-honoring culture start dealing with them in prison. You're calling their names. So get the names and start talking because the Lord himself will bring the conviction in the cell. Mm. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Now this is... I don't Welcome to Witness, I'm Raggy Omar. Western journalists travel the world reporting on countries undergoing war and upheaval, but some think we should be turning our cameras on ourselves to cover the unreported war going on in the inner cities of many developed countries. Birmingham is England's second city. The place is undergoing a renaissance, but alongside luxury developments and shopping precincts are deprived areas where drugs and crime are rampant and gang culture rules the streets. Think where you are today. Reuben Tomlinson knows firsthand. His cousin died in his arms after an altercation in a nightclub. Reuben knew that if he continued mixing with this crowd, he wouldn't survive for long. So he joined the Young Disciples, a group set up to help kids find a way out of street crime. The Disciples know what they're talking about because they're former gangsters. Birmingham residents and filmmaker Ben Robinson took to the streets to see what life was like for gangsters made good. Man, I get shot, man, I get stopped in, man, I get stopped in this world that we live in, and the cops are patrolling. I want to see a black dog on out of the rolling. My name is Ruben Tomlinson, and um, I'm a young person's and family's development officer. Because I'm black, because the world in the streets over on the attack, black boys. Let's start doing good, but we need to show this world that we can be, because some of the guns and the gangs was that's not good now. My job involves working with young people on a one-to-one -one basis, going out there into the community and engaging with those young people who are isolated from mainstream provision. Reuben is a member of the Young Disciples, a community group working in the inner city of Birmingham. This is Los Els, and like its bordering areas of Aston, Handsworth and Newtown, it has many social problems. It's a far cry from the swanky hotels and designer shops of Birmingham city centre, just five miles away. Here in Los Els, unemployment is high, and for many young people, life is really tough. Gang culture and a life of crime is an all too easy and tempting alternative. Ruben and the Young Disciples are just one of the organisations working from within the community to help reduce the culture of crime. Gang violence revolves around who belongs to a particular zone or region. In Birmingham, it's all based on something as juvenile as the postal code. Gang members identify themselves by representing or repping their postcode. If you're young, and even if you're not connected with any gang, crossing into another postcode from where you live can get you into serious grief. A bus route could potentially be a death sentence for some kids because travelling via a bus across many other areas to get to another area poses a lot of problems for some individuals. Being in the wrong place at the wrong time is a constant problem as Reuben found out. 
His life was changed forever when he watched his much-loved cousin die in his arms after a violent shooting. My cousin um, and myself and, and a friend of ours was all out. We left Birmingham and went to a party in Huddersfield. There was a jealous, tense atmosphere in the club. A group of lads started to get very heated. The guy drew for a gun and shot my cousin. Now, where I come from, you don't stand and watch something like that happen. You're in there. So my reaction straight away without thinking was get in there and I've got involved into the tussle. And when I've got in the tussle, I'm holding the gun man. At that point, I glimpsed from the corner of my eye. Someone coming to me with a long knife and he stabbed me. And it's by the will of God why, how I got away from there. God rest his soul, my husband died at that point, And that was the critical point that changed me. Creating a God honoring culture. It's in this environment, this challenge, that we need to ensure that we understand that the enemy has gone out to take a number of our youths. And it's a God honoring culture and approach that's going to literally go and say, Give us our youths back. So it's important that as churches, as we talk about creating this culture, that we know the realities of what we're creating the culture to do, because these are strongholds that we're dealing with also. So I know I go to church and I enjoy, I, I, I'm praising, I'm worshiping, but at the same time, I'm crying because my heart is saying, God, I'm here, but they're there. Yeah. Hallelujah. They're there, Lord. They're there. Most of the youths are not in church. We know that. When Jesus said, I've come to seek and to save those who are, I like all the found youths to go back, as Mark says, and go for the lost. Hallelujah. I love that. That's my heart. Every found youth to say, you know what? God, I'm honoring you, and I want to find my brother, my friend, my this. Uh, he's in prison, Lord. I need to go to the prison. Father, I need to write him. I want that. Because that is then literally multiplying the energy of a God-honoring culture that is going into the prison, it's on the streets, it's in every space. That's what excites me as a possibility. Hallelujah. Because you know what? Look at the pipeline. That's it. Marginalization. And all of these men are our sons and women are our sons and daughters. If they're not part of your church, they're your sons still and your daughters still. Look at the Grave or prison? No. Church. The power of Jesus Christ. The anointing of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Creating a God-honoring culture. Body, soul, and spirit. That's what I want these young men and young women to have. Those are in church. I know that they're here. But I'm saying today that God-honoring attitude, thinking, and behaviors. That's what we need. And that's what I work on when I'm in the prison. I'm saying that when I see a young man that was hardcore, broken, sense the love of Jesus, and starts melting... His heart's melting. He starts crying. I've seen, I've seen it happen before my... Thinking, God, this is you here right now. Creating a God on in culture, living incarnationally. What does that mean? It means that we live with the character of Yeshua, Jesus Christ. Philippians 2 verse 5, have the character of Christ. That's what creates this culture. You practice it every day. I've only been playing the drums... Um, five months. I started playing the djembe. I, I, I had an energy and I, thought, I started. So I go to lessons on a Thursday. Like tonight, I'm going to a lesson. So to create something, you have to practice it. Creating it is, is not like the um, sat-nav on a mobile phone. or in your, It's like going to the old maps. You have to look at it. You have to plan the route. That's what it is. Understanding our God, honoring responsibilities rooted in scriptures. We need to be conspicuous in our faith. In other words, you're not just preaching, you know, but you are conspicuous in your action and your attitude of faith. A God honoring conversation with young people. That's where I'm at at the moment. Responsibility. Back to where I started the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Hallelujah. I'm anointed. And the anointing is this God honoring culture I'm talking about because the spirit of the Lord is upon me. But I can't say the spirit of the Lord is upon me and I'm anointed and I do nothing with it. Now, I'm going to be a bit theological here in a particular way. My, my, my PhD, my research, had a particular model to look at the situation regarding young people. If we're talking about creating a God-honoring culture. And I've used practical theological lenses because it means that you have to do something. A God-honoring culture means you have to do something. It's a culture. A culture does stuff. Culture expresses stuff. 
A culture is dynamic. So a god honoring culture here, we need to understand if we're going to talk about young people, because what is the current experience in the context of our youth? Who's talking to our young people about that? Where are they? How are they feeling? What's their challenges? Because after they've left church on a Sunday, how do they feel Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday? How do they feel that a young man can't come from Hansworth down to here? Did you know that? Did you know that there's certainly young men and young women can't come down this side? What would happen to them if they came down here, please? What would happen to them, sir? What could happen to them? They could die. Let's deal with it for what it is, my friends and family. They could die, literally. Some have died, but I'm saying when we've got created God on encounter, we're going to tear down those strongholds. That's what we are going to do. We're going to, all the churches that's there, we're going to tear down those strongholds. That's what we've got this authority to do. Hallelujah. And that's what I do in the prisons and on the streets. Can't go where? What are you talking about? What, what postcode is this? Isn't this God's postcode? What, you, what, what did you say again? B8, I'm coming there today. What did you say? B9, I'm, I'm there. <laughs> Hallelujah. A God honoring culture. <laughs> Glory to you. I'm excited. <laughs> so you know what? That's what I do. I bring people together because I'm honoring God myself. The prison are astounded at the people that I bring together in the prison. These are hardcore men that are oppositional. And I'm saying this is a God-honoring space. What are you talking about? Fight who, Don? What did you say? And that's the authority. Hallelujah. It's the authority, Errol. It's the authority. So the God-honoring culture that we are talking about here takes authority over principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high, low in between spaces. Hallelujah. And that's what I'm excited about because I'm seeing changes. I'm, I'm talking to you about changes that I've seen. I've seen people who are oppositional, who are enemies in the same space, and I've seen them love. I've seen them cry together, and you would not believe it. The prisoners say, what have you done to them? Hey, it's just God honoring, isn't it? That should become a standard repertoire. It's like when Peter and John was going to, to pray and Peter and John were there and this guy was, wasn't well. He was lame, they say, the Bible says. And Peter and John said, look, we ain't got no, John, have you got any money? I ain't got none. You, ain't you got none? I thought, well, my friend, we ain't got no money, you know. But you know what? We have something else here. So in the name of Yeshua, please just get up. And he said, immediately he's, he gained strength. But the, that's not the bit I want to say. People got all excited. Wow, did you see what happened? And Peter said, oh, what's your problem? This is standard. It's supposed to happen. So in a God-honoring culture, I'm excited, but it's supposed to happen when young men are saved and young women are saved and they are saying, you know, I've changed. They were on the streets and now they're not. That's God-honoring culture because it changes life and impacts life. That should be happening. And I'm seeing that happening today. Hallelujah. I'm excited, Lord. So my research then looked at some stuff. I questioned the men. I've been with the men. I've seen how they respond. I've seen their anger. They've cussed me down. They said, F you. I've been all of that. But then no, that's just like, it's like Jesus went, Jesus went in. If, if, if you read, read the Luke narrative, Jesus went in and said, you, you're with that man again and that woman again. They're always cussing Jesus. Why are you in their house? Well, you know, it's just love, isn't it? <laughs> You, that prostitute, you, she's washing your, your feet. What's your problem? What's your problem? Hallelujah. God honoring culture. So I've been doing some assessment. And then my theological reflection on the word and action. Am I practicing what I preach? Am I practicing what I preach, Pastor? Colleagues, friends. Do I practice what I preach? So when I have just talk, spoke about this God honoring culture here today, and then you go to ask the guys in prison, you know, this guy called Carver came to speak to us, you know, is he what he said he is? No, what do you mean? Did he say that? No. No. <laughs> I would hope they wouldn't say that. I would hope they say, you know what, whatever he said about truth, he's done it to us. Hallelujah. I've got another five minutes, I think, and then I'll, I'll just have some questions. Is it another five minutes, sir? So I've revised my practice over the years because of my assessment about me honoring God. I said, God, if I honor you, it's supposed to be in my lifestyle and how I do what I do. Breaking the chains, breaking the chains. A God honoring culture literally sees the shackles and that's what a God honoring culture deals with. It, because the restriction, the limits, limits of action, holds back. I'm saying that God honoring culture looks at that and that's, 
with everyone that is going through that, it shatters it. Shatters it. Cutting off life supply, no, I'm giving you life. Hallelujah. Chains of oppression, no, I'm giving you a power and anointing today. You are blessed and highly favored. I was depressed, low self-esteem. I'm saying to you today that God, that God honoring culture does that. And it just doesn't say it, you know, because there's a dynamic in the divine authority. That's what I'm trying to say. It's not just about the words. I, I analyze, I evaluate. It's not just about the words. It's about what is behind it. So uh, God on culture, negative tapes. That's why it deals with that. It, it includes that trauma. Well, I've come against that today. I, believe me, I'm saying something with young people with a God honoring culture, I've seen them and I've seen trauma go. I acknowledge trauma, but I've spoken to trauma. I've spoken to it. So once they've told me, because a God honoring culture brings truth. So when they tell you all the truth, and please, some of you are going to have to deal with some pained young people. But it's okay, because once they're in a God honoring space, it deals with that pain. Building on what we have and what we are. Let's build then. God honoring culture. It means that you believe in the authority of scripture. That's what a God honoring culture. Believe in the authority of scripture. It means that you understand that there's an impact. Once you have grasped what scriptures say and you start living it, it means that your involvement in what you believe, you don't just leave it to other people. You do something. You live it. What I'm saying to you today, I live it every day. It's my lifestyle. The lifestyle that I live. I don't put it on and take it off like my clothes. It's just me, isn't it? It's what it is. I'm dedicated. Those of you who know me know my dedication 100%. 100%. Holding accountable. I'm held accountable for what I've just said here. I'd hope that if I have oppositional error would come to me and say, Pastor Carvey, you said something when you came to the exchange, you know, what, what were you doing? That's not what you just said then. Accountability. I don't think I'm all of that. I'm accountable. An opportunity to serve. I always see this. Today, I see an opportunity to serve. Planning, yes, I planned all of this. See, I planned it, PowerPoint, this, that. It's a planning, isn't it? And I hope that there's some empowerment happening here today. <laughs> yeah. And our God-given skills, spiritual gifts, knowledge, and responsibility should bring glory to God as we build a God-honoring culture that potentially attracts and engages young people. Now, I know for me, <coughs> young people are attracted to what they see in me. I know that. I'm by them and they're saying... Young people, they're not even from, but, you know, they come and they say, yeah, big man. And I'm thinking, what's that about? It's because I'm honoring God and it's, it's attractive. So they don't, they don't see me as wishy-washy and some weak pastor that's coming. Uh, they see me as someone who's got energy, who's got, you know, act today. Then. Hallelujah. Ready? Are you ready? Recognize the need to build a God-honoring culture. That's the art. E, engage in critical conversations with young people. I do that all the time. Young people are paying them, that I speak to them in everything that they go through, I understand. And I try to engage with them. A, acknowledge your potential to create a new and different culture. D, deciding to move beyond the present situation and why your involvement is next. Thank you. Wow. Wasn't that rich? There's so much said there, deep for us all to think about. Are we, are we carrying a God honoring culture? Are we living it? If we are, there's a response. There's a response in the atmosphere. There's a response that we carry when 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 we're carrying that culture. There's a trauma as we speak to them. Lives are transformed because we're we're living this God honoring culture. Are we carrying His presence in our life? It's a serious question for us all. It begins with us, right? Wherever we are, in that, we're at work or we're at church, are we carrying this presence of God in our life? Are our lives so set apart for God? Are our lives so in tune with God? Is the word of God in us that wherever we go, there's a sense of the presence of the glory of God, the authority of God in our life that we change atmospheres, we influence cultures. We're saying, God, give us this generation. We're saying, God, give us this city. But are we in position? Are we in place? I remember seeing Carver speak some years ago, and I've, I said to him before, I'm, I've just gotten saved pretty much. I don't know if I was even a Christian then, to be honest. But uh, my cousins went to George Street New Testament Church of God. It's the old building then. And I remember sitting in the back of this church, and there was some praise and worship, and then invited Carver up. He was a, he's a speaker. And the presence of God was in this place. And Carver simply stood on the platform like this, as you've seen him standing today. And he kind of went, Hmm. <laughs> Scratch his chin. 
And the wind of the presence and power of God came into that place. And there was no service after that. The service was, was turned upside down. I'm telling you, the power of God came. People were all over the place. It was just, I am saying to myself, God, I want that. How did you get to use that man like that? All he did was stand there. But it was the presence of God. I never forget it. I never forget it. You've heard him talk about going into places where young people are in prisons or wherever they are and, and being able to bring unity to transform to their hearts to melt. Yes. Guys, this is not exclusive to one person. This is Bible, man. This is Bible. The Idea Exchange Conference is hosted by Bridgepoint Church based in Birmingham in the UK. To find out more about the the conference and the church, visit www.bridge-point-church.com. And as always, we ask you to share this audio recording with your colleagues or friends who you think may also be interested in hearing it. And you can share it directly from the link here, or they can go to the iTunes page where they can search Rising Generation and they'll find it right there. Thank you. God bless you.